Welcome to a point for reflection for Tuesday the 9th of June 2020. When was the last time you had a real good laugh? I suppose there is not much to laugh about at the moment, what with the COVID-19 pandemic and the issues that have led to the Black Lives Matter protests, and so many of our plans are now put on hold. Our sense of humour is quite personal. Different things make us laugh, even if there is sometimes points where we laugh with others. Laughter can also be infectious and healing. But one comedian will have one person in absolute stitches, while another will watch the same and be unmoved. Some people are so good at telling a joke, and others simply forget the punchline. It used to be frowned upon to laugh in church. Religion was a very serious matter. Now you can buy books full of sermon quips. Our image of Jesus is often more serious, which may be why Willis Wheatley's painting, The Laughing Jesus, has become so popular. The Hebrew scriptures often don't have much to laugh about. There are many battles and lots of gore. But one story stands out, giving laughter some prominence. This is from Genesis chapter 18, starting at verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favour with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and dress yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk, and the calf that he had prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I have grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the said time I will return to you, in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, but she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. And carrying on the story from Genesis chapter 21, reading from verse 1. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. As a society, I think we have moved on from the stigma that some attach to being childless. That stigma was very real and heartfelt in other cultures and other times. It is still the case in some parts of the world today, and according to press reports last September, a woman of around 73 or 74 years of age gave birth to twins in eastern India following IVF treatment. 
she cited that God had answered their prayers. Sarah and Abraham would have longed for a child and even tried to circumvent the stigma by Sarah offering her slave woman Hagar to Abraham and that produced a son, Ishmael. This only creates more conflict within this unit and especially between the two women. Abraham was 86 at this time and had waited for at least another 13 years before this story takes place and a son is promised to Abraham and Sarah. In the intervening years, a covenant is made between Abraham and God. Even though some scholars suggest that the year may not actually be 365 days, which also suggests the actual ages of people in these stories may not be quite what they are reported to be, it is quite sad to see them as a couple, thinking they are beyond pleasure. But the thought of having a child when it is suggested that she is beyond childbearing was, for Sarah, laughable. It seems to be a normal human reaction. How many people have reacted to a call from God with treating it like a bit of a joke, even when it's not to have a child when you're so old? We laugh when God has called me to preach. I don't think we are questioning God so much as questioning ourselves. Though I've heard people say God must have made a mistake when they were called. We rejoin the story as Sarah gives birth when Abraham is a hundred years old. The son's name seems quite appropriate as Isaac is a Hebrew name that means laughter. Within this story there are several things which are touched on but we still really would prefer to avoid. Issues around sex and sexuality have long bothered the church whose attitude has been most unhealthy and God forbid we should experience pleasure and joy. There are issues around what we desire. Having children can be the most fulfilling and rewarding experience, but for others it can be fraught. When people give in to expectations from others to have a family or think it will do something for them, it often only leads to heartache. There is the freedom for people today to choose to not have any children or to abstain from sex. There is also the heartache of not being able to conceive for a much longed for child. I remember hearing a very elderly lady in one of Leek's care homes talk about being a disappointment to her father because she was not a boy. I heard a retired minister speak about his time in ministry and the people who were racked with guilt because of their sexual desires that they could not discuss or live out with their husbands. Sexuality had been repressed for their whole lives. It seems so sad that life could not be lived to the full for these people. But the problem was not God, it was other people. There is also the issue to be careful what you wish for. Abraham and Sarah were a fairly dysfunctional family and the relationships which include slaves and offsprings don't sort out any of their issues. Hagar and Ishmael get sent away because of Sarah's jealousy. Then there is the awful story of Abraham taking Isaac to be offered as a sacrifice to God. The image we have offered to us is often of Isaac being a child, but some people who have studied the text suggest that Isaac was by now an adult, and although an angel of the Lord prevents Abraham slaughtering Isaac, the damage has been done. It appears from the text that Isaac leaves his father to stay in the southern part of Canaan. Sarah dies from a broken heart, and through Abraham's interference, Rebekah is found as a wife for Isaac. However, the family's dysfunction continues with Isaac's children, Esau and Jacob, but that is another story. I hope sometimes that when I look at these stories, actions attributed to God were not from God. I do not see how the loving God of Jesus could ever ask people to kill, even in war, or slaughter as sacrifices their own children. Part of the working through of these stories is the journey humankind has made to come to the understanding of God that we have today. If we look hard enough, we do find it in these ancient texts, so I wonder if it is human folly that keeps it so well hidden. It was also the belief that anything that happened was because God willed it so. Yet our free will and modern understanding of nature reveals that that not to be true. It is often just part of the natural order, or because of human beings, though our understanding of God should inform how we respond to another's suffering and the latest disaster. 
The redeeming feature of this family story is that despite everything, God works through them and is made known by them. It surely gives us hope that even in our own context, God can work through us and we too can make God known. The lessons from these ancient stories is to learn to live life to the full, to enjoy life, to enjoy our sexuality, and when we can, to have a good laugh. Maybe we will discover God not just in the pains of life, but in its pleasures also. And maybe God will be in the laughter we so often need. Loving God, we thank you for a good laugh. We pray that even in our current situation, we will find something to laugh at and someone to laugh with. May our laughter be a true blessing and may we find you in our joy. We pray for those who at this moment have nothing to laugh about. Encompass them in your love. Amen.